Congress has spent years contemplating how everything we consume has an impact on the landscape. In 2004, she completed the Zenea Ecological Gardening Program in BC and fell in love with permaculture, among many other things. To really be able to do permaculture design, she went for a degree at the Housing and Community Design. While she fell in love with Halifax too and now practices permaculture and ecological landscape design in Halifax through her business, Garden Mula. Currently, she has the most amazing job she could ever imagine, a permaculture designer at Common Roots Urban Farm, where she is helping create a community farm on the common, facilitating a collaborative uh, creation of productive, handmade public spaces with people, exclamation point, and plants, another exclamation point. So please help me welcome Jamie Morrows. Yeah. Um, 
So I'm seeing all around people are asking these sort of questions of themselves and asking like, what, okay, great, what do I do? And so for so many of us, um, one of the first steps is buying local organic food, right? Um, and then for a lot of people, the next step is how do I grow some of that food? How do I make my last name more productive? So how many of you grow some kind of food plant? Um, okay, this is going to be a great crowd to ask this question to. Besides, what are some of the benefits of growing food besides just the food? The shema. Pretty. Hmm? Attractive. Yeah, beautiful. Joy. Joy. Connection. Connection. Community. Habitat. Habitat. Creating habitat, fostering biodiversity. Sense of purpose, totally. We get to do something, we get to make some changes, we get to do some good work. Yeah, and sharing. As a gardener, and if you can produce a surplus, you've got something to give away. You get to be generous, which is great. Growth. Growth, yeah, and so we get to see, we have a deeper understanding of the cycles of life and death and of growth. And there's abundance of metaphors. Cyclical. Yeah, yeah, cyclical understandings. Um, yeah, and uh, we get to see the fruits of our labor, we get some exercise, and we um, generally gain a little more ecological literacy. Okay, so how many of you came for the, um, because you saw edible landscaping? How many of you came because you saw food forests? Great, okay. So, um, okay, so over the years, I've come to see uh, gardening as a spectrum. And so on one hand of the spectrum, we have our cultivated landscapes. Um, my, this presentation is really image heavy. So if anybody wants to like like get on closer, if you can't see things, do. Like drag your chairs or whatever. Um, OK, so gardening is a spectrum that I see. I call it the spectrum of forest gardening, because I think that's sexier. Um, and so on one hand, we have uh, the cultivated landscapes, which tend to be uh, high maintenance, highly manipulated, and generally a high energy input of um, human energy and also fossil fuel energy. And so then sometimes those landscapes are highly productive, and sometimes those landscapes are very low productivity, like a lawn or maybe the public garden. Well, I guess it depends on what you're producing. Um, and so then on the far end of the spectrum, we have the forest, which is um, non-manipulated, not cultivated, low energy input, both in human energy and in fossil fuels, but super high productivity, right? That forest produces so much. And so then, you know, there's that whole spectrum in between where we've got organic farming, we've got ecological gardening, we've got forest gardening, we've got ecoforestry. And of course, it's not a tidy line, it's just a whole big murky middle in there. Okay, so what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try, I'm going to start a bit at the cultivated end, and then I'm going to work over to the far end in a nonlinear manner. Um, okay, so. Uh, just to make sure that people are satisfied. Here we go. Six quick and dirty edible landscaping tips. Are you ready? Great. Okay, number one. Use formal design, formal patterns, but fill them with vegetables. Look at these great examples. Can you see them? Uh, yeah, formal designs, filled with vegetables, lovely. Um, when I hear the word landscaping, I think that people are still wanting to conform to conventional senses of aesthetics. So, here you go. Number one. Okay, number two. Use kale and chard as annual ornamentals. They're beautiful. They can be big. They're highly productive. They're edible. They work really well. You can plant cars and park them on the streets. And uh, they look pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See this fellow with kale? It's so lovely. 
right? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, three, tip number three, edible flowers. Did you know that tulips are edible? They are, they're delicious, they taste a bit like snow peas, the different colors taste different. You can experiment and try, beautiful in salads. Daylilies too. Um, I just learned when I was doing this one that phlox, I didn't know that perennial phlox um, were edible, but they are. Does anybody off the top of their heads have another flower that they want to add to that? This is not as common. Hmm? Calendula. It's on there? Yeah, great. Nasturtiums. Rose of Sharon. Hibiscus. Yeah. I've heard that they are, but I would double check before I ate them. Hmm. Rose flowers. Daylilies. Again. Violets. Yeah. Daylilies. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a bunch, and if, so if you like Google edible flowers, there's a ton on there, and so probably lots of people have edible landscaping already. They just didn't know. Courage. Courage. For courage. <laughs> uh, great. Okay. Quick and dirty tip number four. Trellises. Uh, expensive, fancy ones that hold big, heavy plants like grapes or hops, fabulous. Uh, smaller, handmade, woven ones with branches that you did with your kids, it's gorgeous. Obelisks, archways, and you can put beans or peas on them so easily and they look so beautiful. Um, Scarlet runner beans are a really great one because they have red flowers that the hummingbirds love. And then they produce really huge, nice big beans that, if you get them at the right time, they're hot pink and black. They're so 80s. <laughs> okay, quick and dirty tip number five. Use blueberries as ornamental shrubs. They're big, they produce a ton. They turn red in the autumn. Their flowers are pretty. The blueberries that they produce are gorgeous. As an added bonus, you'll get lots of birds in your yards, particularly blue jays, which you can also then get loads of exercise from by chasing the blue jays away. Um, yeah, and so you need two varieties for them to pollinate. FYI. Great. Okay, quick and dirty tip number six, my favorite. Fruit trees. So um, here in Nova Scotia, we can grow apples. Pears, plums, cherries, peaches. I've seen people grow apricots. We grow, we can grow persimmons. Who knows persimmons? Yeah, not bad. Persimmons are um, really common in Japan, and they're heavy producing, and then they produce these big orange, really sweet fruits that stay on the tree after all the leaves have fallen, so they look absolutely gorgeous. And then the Japanese will string them all and hang them in these long strings, and the fruit's kind of dry. And um, yeah, so they're great. We can grow them here. Quinces? Am, am I missing any? Medlar. Medlar? Tell us about the medlar. It's a, it's, uh, it's a fruit that uh, grows on the tree, and then uh, it'll ripen when you take it off. And what, do you know what family it's in? Is it like uh, a... Cool, great. I think it's a, it tastes kind of like an apple and raisin. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, we'll get to the nuts. We'll get to the nuts. Um, okay, so um, there's lots of fruit trees. When you're buying your fruit trees, talk about pollination. Some of the fruit trees are self-pollinating, and some of them are not. So that's something you need to pay attention to. And the other thing you want to pay attention to is the rootstock, because the rootstock determines the climate as well as the size of the tree. And so if you're buying a fruit tree locally, chances are it's going to be on the right rootstock, but that you can de determine whether it's going to be appropriate for to put in a container or your front yard, or if it's going to get into a big tree. Um, sea buckthorn, and I've heard of sea buckthorn. Yeah. 
It's a shrub, isn't it? And it's a nitrogen fixer, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sea buckthorn and medlar. Mulberries. Mulberries. I forgot about mulberries. Hawthorn. And hawthorn. Yeah. Great. Nice work. Um, okay. And so then you can see in some of those pictures, there's espalier. You guys know espalier? Great for urban yards. So pretty, you can put them up against the fence or make a fence. Um, and so it's pruning them into almost two dimensions. Um, and so it's a highly manipulated way of growing, um, but it's a highly productive way. And so all of those trees, as far as I know, you can espalier. And um, yeah, and so even in tiny urban situations, you can still do fruit production. And it's undeniably gorgeous, if you ask me. All right. Okay, so who can name some, so, okay, so what's the difference between an annual and a perennial? An annual? One year. Perennials? He's coming back. What is some of the benefits of growing perennials? Yeah, you don't have to prepare the soil again and again. And so what are some of the benefits of that for the soil, from the soil's perspective? Exactly. The soil community gets to hang out and grow and build there. So there's less erosion, there's less disruption, and those plants can kind of form a community. They have some stability. We don't have to kind of keep digging. Um, it's less work. Uh, often there can be less um, fertilizers or amendments needed. Okay, so what are some perennial food crops that we can grow here? Rhubarb. Rhubarb. Horseradish. Horseradish. Asparagus. 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 Fiddleheads. Strawberries. Chives. Trying to put to the next one? Yeah, so I have a list that I didn't get horseradish last year. Oh no. Back one. Um, yeah, so there's perennial food crops. And so this is um, something that is good to consider. Great, okay, next slide. Native food plants. Who can name some native food plants? Chanterelles. Chanterelles, yum. High bush cranberry. Cranberry. Burdock. Burdock. Burdock's not native, I don't think, but it's a food crop and it, it's naturalized, yeah, totally, totally. And the line between naturalized and native, that's a whole other conversation. Okay, so you can skip to the next. I mean, the main point is that um, there's a whole lot of native food plants. And so what are some of the benefits of knowing and or growing some of our native food plants? They're hardy, they're low maintenance. I'll get there. <laughs> Some of the other benefits are that we can feed ourselves in the woods a little bit more, or just that we're like gaining a deeper understanding of the land that we live on, and maybe a bit of a deeper sense of history, a deeper sense of connection, and that we're growing plants that have co-evolved with the native biodiversity here. It also has the potential of helping us be better stewards, active stewards of our landscapes. Because if we're going out and wild harvesting, if we have little beloved patches of forest, then, and we're keeping an eye on them, that, that gives us the potential to be helpful to those landscapes if they need it. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the landscape that we are embedded in that we live on. Uh, what sort of ecosystem do we live in? What's the predominant vegetation types? Forest. What are, what are some of the trees we find here? Okay, and so I'm, I'm going to break it down a little bit more. What are some of the trees that we find in well-drained soils? Pine? 
Hmm? Oak. Maple. The big sugar maples. Red maples. Fir. Yellow birch. White birch. Hemlocks. Yeah. Service berry. Beech. Ash. Basswood. Yeah. The linden. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. And so what sort of trees do we generally find in poorly drained woods? Spruce. Red, black, spruce, alder. Hmm? Black ash. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. What are some of the trees here that will only germinate under the canopy when it's shady? Oak. Can I hear oak? Shout it out. Yeah. Oak, oak is right. Okay, so there's some trees that only that need the canopy in order to germinate and grow, right? Okay, so oak is one. Sugar maple. Yellow birch. Okay, so what is those type of trees tend to be long lived or short lived? Long lived. Yeah. Okay. So what are the kind of trees that germinate and grow only when it's sunny and exposed? White birch. Gray birch, red pine, poplar, aspens, alders. And so those kind of trees, short-lived or long-lived? Short-lived. OK. So the concept of ecological succession, who knows? Who knows succession? Succession, sterile phases? Is it, can it, someone give, it, give us the, like, the, the quick and dirty version of succession? Yeah, okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, so the main the main concept is that um, uh, a disturbance will go, come through an area, be it a forest fire or a hurricane or a bulldozer and the, the earth, the ground gets kind of devastated. And so there's some plant communities that come in first. And those tend to be the helpers and the healers, right? The weeds and the brambles. And so they will be nutrient accumulators and often nitrogen fixers. I'll get to these terms too. I'm sure you guys can figure out what they are. I probably know, but I'll, I will define them. <laughs> Um, but so they're the ones that help build the soils up, and then those short-lived tree species come in, and then the longer-lived tree species come in until we get to a mature system. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's that sort of main idea. Um, okay, and so aside from forests, what other ecosystems do we surround us? Bogs. Ocean, beach, meadows. We have meadows here. Yeah. And fields. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, back in university again, I got to read this book. And in this book, it says um, that. According to some accounts, when the first pioneers came to New England, they estimated that one in every six trees was a nut producing tree. So those are some of the nuts. Pecan is down in the corner because it's found growing wild um, as far north as Massachusetts. We can grow pecans here. Um, people that have been working with them to bring them up to this climate, and I've seen one in Tadmagush that was huge. Um, but so yeah, we can grow these trees, all these nut producing trees here. Okay, so um, the, that leads to the conclusion or the hypothesis that the native peoples of North America were not just hunter-gatherers, but they were hunter-gardeners. They were forest gardeners that they planted the um, plants that they used, right? Makes sense. 
Um, and so here in Nova Scotia, we have a great example of this, which is the Indian potato, um, also called brown nut. Its Latin name is Apios americana. And so this plant is found all over, but it doesn't set seed in this climate. It's propagated by um, roots. And so uh, the theory is that the Mi'kmaq planted it all over. It was one of their staple food crops. It's, it's Mi'kmaq name is Sigibum, and so the name Shubanakadi apparently is a anglicization of a Frenchization of a Mi'kmaq term, Sigibum Akadi, which is place where the Indian potato grows. And so I found this plant uh, growing wild in the, uh, out by the riverbanks and got so excited to see this, this plant growing wild. Um, so it's a nitrogen fixer, it's a food crop, it's a perennial food crop, um, yeah. And it's one of those ones that's kind of forgotten about. Yeah? What's the last name again? Apios, A-P-I-O-S, Americana. Yeah, well not receive, but propagate. Yeah, and so it's the tuber that was eaten, that's edible. Well, according to the photographs, I've been growing it for, it's my second year growing it. And so it, the roots on mine are still quite small. <laughs> yeah, or me as you. <laughs> um, great, okay, so the main idea of that is like uh, hunter gardener. Gardening the forest. Okay. Um, so, there is a whole discourse called forest gardening, edible forest gardening. There are, there's quite a number of books out, and, um, and so there are these two big books by Dave Jackie, which are the sort of big um, textbooks. Sylvia? Yeah, uh, in the next part, that is the Right, yeah. I don't, I don't think they're native to New England, which is why I didn't put them in there, but I, you're right in that we can grow them and they're a prolific food tree. Prolific-ish? Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so who knows, who knows forest gardening or edible forest gardening? Who's seen one? Yeah, not near enough of us, hey? Um, okay, so edible forest gardening is a consciously designed community of mutually beneficial plants and animals intended for human food production. And so there's this like sort of human element in it because we, like it's kind of undeniable, we're, we're humans and we're doing this. And so um, we should make things that feed us. So that's what edible forest gardening is. Um, a perennial polyculture of multi-purpose plants. The photo down below is an edible food source on a rooftop in the UK. Okay, edible forest gardening is the art and science of putting together, putting plants together in a woodland-like patterns that forge mutually beneficial relationships, creating a garden ecosystem that's more than the sum of its parts. Great, who's sold? Who loves the idea, wants to do it? Totally makes sense. Pretty good. Okay. Um, so how how? Great, fine. How do we do it? So the design process, the design process on the left is the permaculture design process, which is also like classic landscape designing process. And then the one on the right is the Dave Jackie suggestions. So I'll just run through them and then we're gonna the rest of the slides kind of follow the Dave Jackie bits and pieces. So the design process. First, we gather, we gather, we kind of do an inventory of uh, what do we have, what do we need, what do we want, where are we going, like you know, what what are we working with here, and um, so what are those natural elements, and then what are the human elements. So first, we gather the information, and we think about it a little bit, and then we go making design suggestions, which is really easy to say when you're like, you know, in a classroom sort of setting, but often when I'm working with and designing with people, it's really interesting to watch people 
often go above it quite backwards. So, um, yeah, first the inventory. Then we've got to make sense of it. Then think about what sort of design solutions you're going to do. And, uh, yeah, then check out with different people and uh, then do it. Okay, so to, break, to get a little bit more specific, um, Dave Jackie says, first, goals and needs, like what do you want? Second, site assessment, just what does the land want? Three, patterns. Four, plants. Five, cross-reference it all with the principles. Permaculture principles uh, and ecological principles. Then, the, so when, then we get to the implementation stage, and so then um, the first is the site preparation, and then it's the planting. Okay, how am I doing? Interesting temperature gauge. All right. Okay. So um, yeah. So goals and needs. Uh, in this in this sort of present day, I think a lot of us. It's really easy to forget what human needs are because we can just go to Canadian Tire and like buy all this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, before, um, plants were the primary producers of most of our needs, such as some of our, you know, the core of human needs are food, fuel, fiber, fodder for the animals, fertilizer for the plants, and pharmaceuticals, our medicines as well as fun. And so the diagram on the bottom, I would imagine most of you can't really read it. Um, but it's sort of an inventory of all the different things that a food forest can produce. Dye plants, spices, fruits, vegetables, soap plants, basketry materials, holes and canes, medicinal plants, sap and wood products, nuts and seeds, firewood, thyme materials, mushrooms, honey, salad crops and herbs, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so inventory your needs. Then next, take a look at your site, do a little uh, drawing with your crayons. And so this is like looking and listening to your land as much as you can. Um, yeah, ask your land straight out and then sit there and be really patient and listen to the answers. And in permaculture, they say listen for a year. Um, permaculture offers a couple of good um, techniques for helping look at that. And so those are uh, sectors and zones. And so sectors are the big energy flows that move through a landscape. So sun, wind, deer, school kids, yourself, uh, noise, pollution, fire. So those big energy flows, map those big energy flows that move, move across the site. So that's sectors, and then there's zones. And so zones, it's easy to um, conceptualize as concentric circles. The reality is I don't think they ever look like that, but um, okay, so zone zero is the house. Zone one is the spaces, the spaces that you move through daily. Zone two would be that you move through weekly. Zone three is like monthly. Zone four is like yearly. And zone five is the wilderness. So the, the following thinking would be that you put the high maintenance things into zone one. Right? Right. Okay. So inventory assessment. Done. Great. Okay. So you have a sense of what your site wants to be. And so now you want to put in a food forest. And so you might want to look at some patterns. So this here is the key building block. If you're gonna have one thing that you, you're like, okay, yeah, totally food forest, gonna do it, and there's one thing I'm gonna take away from this, this is it. And so this is called a guild. If you uh, Google permaculture guild, you'll get a ton of information on this. And so the main idea is that instead of just planting one thing, you plant a group of things, a community, a guild, that's going to be mutually beneficial so that you can be more lazy in a really good way. So, uh, say you put your fruit or nut tree in the middle of it. 
And then around that, you want to put some of those mutually beneficial plants, which, and so there's four categories to think about. So there is the nutrient accumulator, the uh, insect attractors, the nitrogen fixers, and the mulch makers. Um, okay, so an insect attractor, what, what does that do? Pardon? Yeah, it attracts insects for pollination as well as, yeah, like the predatory insects. And so you're just like trying to increase the biodiversity there, right? Yeah. Um, nutrient accumulator. What's nutrient accumulator? Yeah, comfrey. And so what a, what a nutrient accumulator does, there are those ones with the big deep tap roots, generally speaking. And so what they do is they go down, they drive the roots down, 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 to where all of the nutrients got leached down, and they go down and they get them, and then they pump them back up and bring them up to the top. And so does anyone want to give an example besides comfrey of a really common one that everybody finds in their lawns and then chucks out and then fertilizes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So, yeah, okay. Nutrient humans. Okay, mulch maker? What's mulch maker? There's kind of two flavors of the mulch maker. Yeah. Yeah, so one is those, those plants that, um, they produce mulch. They like, they produce lots of biomass that then falls down and covers the soil. And okay, why is mulch so amazing? Why is mulch like the secret password to permaculture gardening? Totally. Exposed soil is wounded soil. I've been saying that for years, and then I went to California for a permaculture course, and that was like one of the first lines out of the teacher's mouth, and I was like, yeah! <laughs> Exposed soil is wounded soil. If you go into the forest, the soil is always covered because that's the nutrient cycle, right? The, it, the, it breaks down, you get the humus layer, the organic matter, everybody, that's, is that clear? And everyone's unsure. Yeah, it's okay, great. Mulch. Okay, so there's like the plants, the mulch makers, there's the plants that produce the big leaves that you can use for mulch. And then there's also ground covers that act as a living mulch. That, you know, they're just like a nice good dense ground cover and they, they're holding it down. They got it under control. Okay, and then nitrogen fixers? What's a nitrogen fixer? Yeah. Okay, so what does a nitrogen fixer do? Yeah, they've got a bacterial symbiote on their root. They grab the nitrogen from the air, they package it up in a way that the plants can then uptake it. So they're fertilizing, they're fertilizer makers. Okay, so the idea is that you, can you see how it, with these cluster of plants, you get a pretty self-fertilizing, self-maintaining, high biodiversity system. And so um, you plant those around the fruit tree, Right, right at the get-go, and um, and you want to have them around to the drip line. So the drip line is sort of that edge to where the canopy extends. And then as that tree grows, those plants underneath, which are perennials, are also going to grow and expand. And so then you can keep sort of expanding that garden outwards so that it stays under the drip line. And if you want to be fancy about it, then you can um, edge with plants that help keep the grass away, um, such as daffodils, or chives, or garlic onions. Great. What's another example Yeah, comfrey, I think, is a really great one. I think that it's probably the only other arguable use for hostas. <laughs> and um, ostrich ferns do a great job. And I and trees. Yeah, totally. Right? Yeah. I mean, you could like carry them all away, bring them all back the other Right? Okay. Good. Building block. Everybody got that? Is that exciting? Who's seen that before? Who? Who? This is like. This is this like a great new sexy idea to anybody? Yeah. Great. Okay. So. Um, yeah, basic building block is the tree guild. So now you want to step it up, you're actually going to put one in the community garden or like the local schoolyard, 
And so you want to make it a little bit fancier. And so now we can go to the mandala. Um, similar sort of ideas, maybe, I've done a couple of these where that it's uh, five tree guilds. And so the huge, big pecan tree is in the middle. And then the smaller little trees are at the four points around there. And then you can use you know, any sort of variety of mandala patterns for your pathways through there. Um, oh wait, um, yeah, and so then there's another pattern in the bottom which is a little bit more like actually woodlands-like. And so you can see the path, the finger pathways that get, get you up into there, but it's, um, it's, it really has multiple stories. So this is like that huge, big, tall story, and then it kind of steps down and down and down. And then this is where your um, like more annual crops or the smaller sort of things. Yeah, great, good, okay. And so another note about patterns is um, that the forest garden books, the edible forest garden books, um, the volume two is a pattern line. Does anyone know the, the book of pattern language from the 70s? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing book about how to build fabulous communities, cities, and homes. And so what they did is they cruised around and they looked at successful places and then harvested some like simple ideas that you could use in a variety of ways that are going to help make a really great space. And so Dave Jaffe and Eric Tonmeister did the same thing with forest gardens. And so they laid out this kind of framework of patterns that you can pick and choose what's going to work for you and put it together in a variety of different ways. And so an example of some of their patterns are um, zones of water use, pattern your garden in a way. So for those zones of water use, like heavy watering in the same area and low watering in a, like low water needs, right? Um, pits and mounds, create hummocky terrain for diverse habitat, water infiltration, and visual interest. And three layer minimum, have a, you know, minimum of three layers, one, two, ground cover three. Great, okay, patterns. Uh, next one is plants. So these are some plants, plant lists. Um, not near uh, complete. Um, also pretty easy to Google, and you'll find lots of information on these. You'll notice that these plants are also often are um, in biodynamic agriculture and in horology. Most of these plants are multifunctional. And so, yeah, you know, and so you can use that tree pattern and put in a variety of different things in there depending on your climate or situation or sense of aesthetics. Great? Okay. Um, and so then, it's great to cross-reference this with principles. And so this is a shameless plug for the permaculture principles, um, which are, uh, well, I mean, I think that they're profound, and a lot of other people do too, because it's a discourse that's been around for like 30, 40 years now. Um, and so Alex Nicola is giving a talk on permaculture tomorrow afternoon. Great. Okay. So, you've done your assessment. You have an idea what you want. You figured out a design. And so you're moving into the site prep. This is both design and site prep. Um, and a kind of a tangent. <laughs> but the most important, okay, so the most, not the most important thing, but a really important thing for plants is water, right? And at our, in our present situation, our present time, um, in the urban environment, Lots of us just take the stormwater and dump it into the sewage system, and that's a problem. Why is that a problem? It, it overflows the wastewater treatment plant, and then we get raw sewage out into the harbor. So that's one. <laughs> Two is that it's not refilling our groundwater. And three, it's not getting out into the ocean cleaned. 
Like it's just, it's carrying whatever it's carrying off of our roofs and off of the streets. And, um, and so how does water get cleaned naturally? Through the soils, through wetlands. It's basically through biological activity on plant roots. So, um, rain gardens is kind of an emerging discourse. And uh, so if you Google rain gardens, you'll find tons of interesting stuff. And especially stateside right now, there's a number of municipalities that are doing some really, really interesting stuff around stormwater management. And, um, and yeah, so I got a book recently out of Portland, Oregon called Rain Gardens. And um, yeah, so um, it is currently illegal in HRM to take your stormwater and dump it into the stormwater system. Now, we're supposed to manage it on site. And the EAC is doing a project on that. Most of us still dump it into the, like the way our houses are set up, is that the water comes off the roof and just down and below. But in, like that's supposed to change, and it could change. And um, I'm going to read a quote from that rain garden book. Um, Rainwater harvesting has the potential for us to bring water back to the surface and for it to animate the landscape in ways that we cannot completely dictate, but only anticipate and, accom and accommodate. Um, yeah. All oh, right. Um, so I said that the EAC is doing a stormwater project right now. And so the EAC is the Ecology Action Center. OK, so say you're like, oh, like I, I need to manage my stormwater better, not dump it into the drains and or get it away from my basement. And, um, and I know that there's this exciting potential here to integrate it into my landscape, to help feed my plants with it, make that water cleaner. Then um, here are some um, exciting, exciting ways that we can do that. So we've kind of broken it down into the main components of the rain chain. Um, and then, so these can be put together in a variety of ways. And so first the water comes down off your roof and it could come down in the gutter or it could come down a rain chain, which is so pretty. Or look at those other exciting um, things. The one on the right there. It's not, these are plants. And so you can see that the water comes down and it gets branched on each of those and then cuts it. So there's some exciting art things. Um, and then outflows is where it makes contact with the ground. Coming off the roof makes contact with the ground. At that point, the water has energy and a lot of potential for it to do something interesting. Then there's rainwater harvesting. Um, cisterns, rain barrels, ponds, save it for later, maybe it's your drinking water, maybe it's your irrigation water. Then we have these things called stormwater planters, which are basically, um, the water can go in there and it's planted with plants that um, have, they can tolerate periodic flooding, and but then they, they're okay if they don't get rained on for a while. But if they get like thoroughly drenched, they're totally cool. And so the rain can go through these systems and like fill that right up and like percolate through slowly. And they're designed with like appropriate overflows and all of that kind of stuff. And so we're starting to see these at the bases of like big high rises and stuff like that. In Europe, there's more of these. So stormwater plants. Um, okay, and then moving water through the landscape, we've got some options. One is like a pretty straightforward gully. Um, and maybe like a concrete one or something that's like solid and impermeable or maybe something that looks a little bit more like an ephemeral stream. Gullies. Then we have swales. Who knows swales? More of you soon will. I love swales. Okay, so swales are on contour. What does on contour mean? Same level. Right? Not like, not like this, but like, like this. So that the water goes in and fills up. So it fills up there, and then it gets down 
into and it helps recharge our water tables, both the like deep aquifers as well as our local little groundwater tables. And so you can see from this that um, a variety of microclimates are created from this system. So one, the water can reflect light, right? So the amount of light in there is increased. And then you can see that on the top here, it's going to be more dry. But over in here, the plants have pretty easy access to that water. So this is a way of carrying the water through our landscapes. And so the main thing you want to do with water is slow it, spread it, sink it. Can we want to all say that together so we get it? Ready? Slow it, spread it, sink it. That's what you want to do with water. Um, and so you can connect a series of swales so that one's connected and then once it overflows, it goes into the next one. Fills that one up, goes into the next one. Right? Okay, um, so say you don't have enough room for, so I'll get your question in a sec. Say you don't have enough room for a swale, um, you just have a little area, and so what you want to do is you want to get your storm water just down and give it a place where it can go in. Then a rain garden is um, the, uh, the site prep, is you've got room for that water to get in there with lots of drainage, and then you've planted it with plants that can tolerate that periodic saturation. And that's a rain garden. Those are some examples. Questions? Yeah, going back to your uh, rain barrel harvesting, mm -hmm. some, especially for urban gardeners, some of the stuff I've researched is because we have asphalt roofs, the water comes off that asphalt roof into your rain barrel, recommend it not to put that into your edible garden because of contaminants. Have you heard that or a way to filter it or? I have heard that. Um, and I mean, actually, it's lovely to find something that you can find. I would love to find the science on that. I would love to find the science on that. Um, so, but there is definitely ways of filtering. And so, um, the ways of filtering are, fundamentally, it's the, it's the, biological activity on plant roots and other surfaces. And because bacteria and fungi are the primary decomposers of our world, right? And so they're the ones that take things and break it down. And so if you look at um, gray water treatment, constructed wetlands, or living machines, which are all biological water cleaning systems, then what they have is a series of um, plant tanks and sometimes like gravel tanks that have been inoculated with pond scum, a variety of different pond scums, which are bacteria, right? And so those are the things that take the chemicals and break it down. And so I would love to do those and like see the science on those, like do water testing on those. Yeah, and so I've seen rain barrel systems that do go through little handmade, um, yeah, gray water systems, um, where it'll have like three rubber mates, and rubber mate number one has got plants in it, rubber mate number two has got one inch gravel inoculated with pond scum, and so I've seen some, um, at that last permaculture training I did, where bin number three was worms, it was a worm bin. And so they designed it in a way that the water would flush through, and so it would drain completely, but I'm sure most of you know that worm castings are biologically rich. And so that, um, yeah, helps clean the water. And apparently the worms can take it. I haven't tried it yet. Okay, so, last three slides. Um, yes? My fault is a wonderful worm treatment uh, assisted work is slaughterhouse. Nice goes from one pond to the other, and the first pond is just green, the jumpy, something dusty, Awesome. Yeah. 
Yeah, so they're out there. We've got local examples. Yes, okay, I've got three slides left. Um, okay, so now you've uh, thought about all of this. You did your research, you've designed yourself a forest garden. Like, okay, great, now we're gonna do it. All right, step one. You, well, I guess it's more like step nine by now, hey? Um, you get your fruit trees and you get your friends together and you plant them. And then you can sheet mulch. And then you've got food for us. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so that's the last slide. Uh, questions? Okay, hold on, I'll grab her and then I'll grab you. Yeah? Um, I've read a lot of uh, research uh, out west and in the states of people getting together and doing these perma blitzes where you know you have to take part in, say, three in order to have one done yourself, but basically it's a group of people that come and they totally volunteer their time and, and effort and, and transform your your property into a food forest. Is there anything like that going on in America? No, there's not. Although one of the guys who teaches permaculture out here um, has, I think there's quite a bit of interest and I've heard that question a number of times before. And so my guess is that once once someone starts to organize that, it'll go, um, it'll go pretty well. Um, we participated in a series of work parties this year, which was similar, except that there wasn't that like count of three, then get your yard done sort of system. But yeah. Well, I was going case by case, right? I mean, it depends on if that car broke come from China or where. And so cardboard does break down well and easily. Um, take the tape off, take the staples out, and the worms will. And it's abundant. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any example of a in the does anyone know of any good examples of that? tree production in places and um, the Blue's Cat Heritage Center has a recent landscape that's like native with a food, native food plants and useful plants and Windhorse Farm does really beautiful amazing eco-forestry and I'm sure that there's probably... I was kind of like looking for a well, you know what, Alex Danny Cola at that mother oak, he planted his permaculture forest garden um, two or three years ago now. What's that um, His name is Alex Danny Cola, and he'll be speaking tomorrow afternoon. Um, his farm project is called Mother Oak Permaculture.